Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Shane. For those who are new, welcome back if you are returning. Today, I just want to talk about a few more details regarding the Micah Miller case. Micah Miller was a pastor's wife down in South Carolina who was married to J.P. Miller. Allegedly, Micah had a history of mental health issues that has led investigators to believe that Micah may have unalived herself. Not everything is making a lot of sense and that's why we're here to dive into details again and to see if there's anything that we missed, have a discussion about it. I also just want to disclaim that I am not a true crime professional. I am a true crime fan who finds fascination in, in cases like this online and takes what has been made he public on, online. He literally emailed Micah. You disgust me. Everything I say in this video should be taken with a grain of salt unless it's been proven otherwise in court. I just don't want to get sued. So so unless something has been proven without a shadow of a doubt, then we'll just say everything is alleged and my opinion moving forward. In my last video, I thought it was a little bit weird that I hadn't seen any of the gas station footage released. However, a few of you were kind enough to correct me and let me know that it was available. So I'll put the picture up here. That was the last time that Micah had been seen getting gas and I believe an energy drink until she was making the 911 call about an hour and a half later. And it kind of answered my question because I was curious if she was in distress because I felt like, to me, she got gas and the drink so quickly. I think it was like in under eight minutes. Some people agreed with that. Some people didn't. It's an average time to grab a drink and gas if, if you're just trying to get in and out of there. Also in the ring camera footage showing her leaving her apartment for first thing that morning. I ended up watching a really great YouTube video on the Stephanie Harlow YouTube video. So I went through, she had like a two hour video, awesome details that I would definitely recommend checking out her. She pointed out a really good detail that Micah had been listening to it's called The Necessary Endings by Dr. Henry Cloud. And it's essentially about breaking free from relationships or situations that are holding you back. So think about it. At this point, Micah had already gone and put a retainer down for an attorney. We know this because she still has an attorney representing her even in death because the divorce had been filed before Micah died. The divorce is still going to go through the progress. The process. So listening to that type of almost motivational speech after a breakup or a divorce would work really well with what we believe that Micah was trying to do, which was get away from JP. Another one of my questions was answered from my last video. I questioned where Micah had worked. I assumed as a pastor wife, maybe she worked in the church, if not at the very least in Myrtle Beach. She worked at a place called J. Peter's Bar and Grill. When we see her leaving in the morning, we can see that she's dressed and it does look like she's dressed appropriately to work. The question that I still have is what time was she actually supposed to get to work? Because if her phone was on around 3 p.m. when she made the phone call to 911, if she was supposed to be in work before 3 p.m., she would have been getting phone calls from her coworkers and boss to find out why she hasn't reported from work, right? If it's a bar and a grill, maybe she works a later shift, maybe like a 4 or 5 p.m. shift until like 11 or midnight sort of deal. I'm gonna look up the hours right now for Jay Peters. So Jay Peters Grill and Bar is located on 825 Market Plaza Drive, Unit 5 in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Their hours of operation are 11 to 9 Wednesday, oh, every, every day. So she could work that early morning shift, but we already knew based on the timeline that she was traveling at that time. And it didn't look like on the surveillance when she was at the pawn shop around noon, when she was getting gas around 1, 1, 1 30. It didn't seem like she was on the phone with anybody or like texting anybody to let them know where she was. So I'm just gonna speculate that she wasn't due until maybe like three, four o'clock and maybe that's why her phone wasn't getting a bunch of phone calls. And I would just assume that if she was supposed to be in for like 11 or 12, kind of the lunch shift, that by then you would have seen her on the phone at least, at least coming up with an excuse of why she wasn't coming in that day. I'm just gonna assume that maybe she wasn't due until later in the evening. Maybe she worked evening shifts, like three or four until closing time. That's my guess on why coworkers or her employer uh, no red 
red flags were going yet and nobody was calling her and trying to get in touch with her. We're going to talk about the fisherman real quick that found Micah's items. The bag of items was actually only about, I believe it was about 40 meters to where Micah's body was found. And it turns out that there were more fishermen involved in this story. So the very first fisherman had found Micah's belongings, a purse or a fanning pack. I'm going to play the interview with the fisherman, but a couple of things he says kind of raised a red flag for me. Micah Miller's death has been suspicious from the get-go. Even after police officially ruled it a suicide and shared plenty of evidence, her family still has questions. There was no eyewitness to Micah's death that day. There was, however, an ear witness, a fisherman, who was out on the lake at the time of Micah's death. It might be nothing, but there is one point when the, the person interviewing asks how someone would get back there, and the fisherman starts by saying, oh, you can't get there back there by book. Oh, well, actually. I heard a cry back, you know, back when I came in, where I told you I started hearing the crying at. Then I heard a gunshot. It wasn't a loud gunshot. And then the crying just stopped. Right about here, that's when I heard the gunshot. The gunshot went off. How do you get in there if you're, if you're not in a boat? You can't get in there if you, what, what, what do you mean? How was she in there? There's a path that comes in there. That's what I said, told them. Yeah. There was a path that comes into here. Like it just seemed, again, could be nothing, but I just thought it was a little bit odd. Like he almost caught himself saying something. And then the fisherman is quoted saying, I didn't look at it or nothing, talking about uh, Micah's belongings. And there was a path leading straight to where her belongings, belongings were laying at. And then how do you, how did you come across her stuff, her belongings? I just seen it laying up on the bank when I pulled up, up in, here. in here. Yes, sir. It was laying up on the bank. I don't know why I grabbed it. I just grabbed it. Didn't ever look at it or nothing. I got out and I looked around because there was a clearing on the left and the right. And I looked around because I felt like something was wrong, but I never seen nothing. I took the stuff, put it in my boat, went back to the landing. But then a minute later, he goes on to list everything that Micah had in her belongings. Her driver's license, her bank card, she had her um, keys, $500, a little over $500, every bit of that money got back. Not only did he list the belongings, but he listed the $500 cash that we knew Micah had on her at the time, and I believe it was just from the pawn shop where she had just purchased her weapon earlier that day. But then he also stresses that the money is still there. And granted, the, the man was probably just under a lot of stress and being like, listen, I didn't touch anything. There was a 500 there, there's 500 still there. Didn't ever look at it or nothing. Her driver's license, her bank card, she had her um, keys, $500, a little over $500. Every bit of that money got back. I just thought it was interesting enough to note uh, what was said in the interview and he sort of backtracks a little bit. So then come to find out there was a second fisherman who ended up locating Micah's body in the water. I know we had a lot of questions about that like how can you tell a person dropped or where the gun is if they're in water. I believe again I wasn't there there's no more information I can find at the moment about it but they just said that they found her in the water. So I can just assume that maybe he was out fishing and just saw a body in the water. I don't know. Mind you, the police were already looking for Micah because her call was disconnected. They were able to track her phone that led them to the River State Park. And that's when they had found her car in the parking lot. When the police found Micah's car, they saw the gun case in the passenger seat as well as ammunition. Ammunis ammunition in the center console. So News Nation got the chance to speak with Micah's family and this is what News Nation had to say. Quote, to get to the location where Micah Miller's body was discovered, her family had to walk down two separate trails, walk through knee deep water and climb through mud, trees and fallen debris. And it is quoted that most of this walk was in knee deep water. Going back to my very first video, I talked about does not line up with her calling 91 and saying hey I want to be easily found and then travels in water to be I, I, can't, I can't get over the sermon that he made the next day. There's one part that he says that's really kind of not sitting right with me. Micah had just been found the day prior. JP was uh, allegedly informed that evening. He gets up, this is a Saturday, 
He gets up, he goes to church the next Sunday to give his sermon. He's giving a very normal, uh, almost joking, happy, funny sermon. And then at the very end of his sermon is when he decides to drop the ball that his wife unalived herself. But the way, uh, sir, and I am going to refer to Stephanie Harlow's video when I talk about this because she made a fantastic point. But if you were just informed the night prior that your wife was found with a gunshot wound to the head, you, Mr. JP, just went on and assumed that it was her unaliving. You didn't even give the investigators time. It was last night. They haven't even done their full investigation. And you are so confident. Can you imagine the embarrassment, okay? If you got this wrong and you said, oh, my wife passed away this way and then it comes to find out that after an investigation it was a different way. How embarrassing. Wouldn't you only publicly announce the cause of a spouse's death if you knew for sure or if you were trying to lay a foundation. Guys, 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 this is what she did. So if you hear anything else over the next couple of weeks with this story coming out, listen, I already told you. I already... I already told, can I get an amen? I quoted a piece of the sermon where he's talking about Micah's death because he also brings up her mental health. I cannot put myself in a position, let's just say my spouse ought to live themselves. I'm not grieving. I'm not uh, devastated by this. I'm able to get out of bed and put on my nice button down and stand up on stage and crack a few dad jokes because, you know, I'm the pastor and I got to put that front on. But then at the end of my sermon, I start getting a little teary-eyed and I, as hard as I push, I can't quite get a tear to roll down my cheek, but I'm going to sit there and express to you how, how upset that I am that my, my beloved unalived herself, the police haven't confirmed that yet, but unalived herself and, uh, yeah, she also has a lot of mental health problems. You all know that, right? Remember, remember, Micah has mental health problems. Joe, she has mental health problems, right? Everybody knows that she has mental health problems, right? Like, that's what I truly think is going on in this church. So I'm going to just quote something from JP's sermon, and you tell me what you think. This is how he tells the church about his wife's unaliving. Quote, I am taking a little bit of a break, and I don't want to have to worry about the church. Oh, we wouldn't want to worry about that now, would we? That was my own annotation. Sorry. Back to the quote. I don't want to have to worry about the church. My... Uh, my break, maybe a few days, a few weeks, I don't know. I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. It was self-induced, and it was up in North Carolina. And we're going to have a funeral for her next Sunday here at 3 p.m. And I'm just kind of going on adrenaline right now. Y'all pray for me and my kids and everybody. She wasn't well mentally. She needed her medicine that was hard to get to her. Let's speak about her medicine real quick, JP. We're going to cover this in my next video, but I believe that JP had so much more control over Micah than we believe. I think a lot of it is now being uncovered, but in my next video, you're not going to want to miss it because this man was allegedly, according to Micah's lawyer, who is still active, by the way, um, is quoted saying, in fact, he admitted he would cut up her pills and give them to her if she refused to take the medication. We're talking about lithium. Interesting. He would also inject her in the buttocks with steroids oh, to help her libido. That's going to be next video, but I think my biggest takeaway from today was the fact that JP almost, I feel like, told on himself a little bit. Have you ever seen those interviews where they're uh, interviewing a suspect? And I'll, I'll, give you a per I'll give you a perfect quick example. There was a Judge Judy episode. This uh, woman was taking a man's a man to small claims court uh, because he stole her purse. So the lady goes up on the stand and says, uh, Your Honor, 
he stole uh, my, my purse on this this day. Judge says, well, what was in the purse? What are you missing? And the girl starts listing off, well, I was missing my you know, credit card, my wallet, my keys, my headphones. And the guy, the guy who's trying to say he didn't do anything, uh, says, your honor, there were no headphones in that purse essentially telling on himself that he stole that purse. This feels very much like that, where JP maybe shouldn't have known at that moment yet because there hasn't been a full-fledged investigation. And again, I wouldn't be telling everybody I knew, especially an entire church, unless I knew for sure how my wife passed away. You don't want to get that wrong. What's going to happen, Mr. JP? If you go in front of the church and say, oh, Micah unalived herself, and then it comes comes out that she didn't, it was a homicide. Maybe even not for you, but let's just pretend that it was a homicide by somebody else. How silly is the leader of the church gonna look if he just he just told us all that she on a lie to himself and 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 in reality something else happened? Why would you make such an early assumption and get everybody all worked up and then even take it further and say, well, she unalived herself, but also it was because she was dealing with mental health. So you're telling me in under 24 hours, not only do you have the reason why she did it, but you also have the how and the where? Naughty, naughty, we're coming up at you, bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do, what you gonna do when we come for you, oh, you're gonna be in trouble. Alright guys, you're not gonna want to miss our next video, we're gonna be diving into Susie Skinner again, there's a little more information about her and her paraplegic husband who mysteriously also passed away. Mr. JP has also maybe possibly flirting with some waitresses who might have something to say. But that's going to be in my next video. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. And I'll see you in my next one.